welcome. Um, this is the last of our congregational conversations um, regarding human sexuality and gender identity, and we're very glad that each of you has chosen to take this time out of your schedule to attend. Um, this is the first of a two-week series of conversations, so we'll meet here again next Sunday as well. And kind of just to let you know what the format is, today, um, after I talk a little bit, Mike's going to be talking about our mission statement a little bit, then David will be sharing some um, biblical um, I don't know say, thoughts on the biblical things on this. And then we will break down into our small groups, and we'll have some questions today, and at the end, we'll have time for each group individually to report back to the larger group. Um, in 2019, the Deacons Council spent um, many hours in prayer and planning to create a safe space for these congregational conversations. And what we're trying to do is explore our mission statement and how does that relate to human sexuality. Um, in doing that, we have come up with some small group guidelines that I want to share with you. These are also on your table, but I just want to go through them as far as the conversations go. These are conversations. Participation is voluntary. Um, we do want everyone to have a chance to voice their feelings and responses to the questions that are going to be asked. Please be sensitive to that and allow all in your group the chance to speak if they wish to do so. It's all right to abstain from the, um, discussing specific topics if you're not comfortable. There are no right or wrong answers. All answers, all responses are valid. And what these conversations are, they are designed to understand the feelings of our congregation. So we do want you to be um, open and share your thoughts. Please respect the opinions of others, even if you don't agree. Please try to stay on topic. And if need be, the facilitator will interrupt so that we can cover all the kind of questions in the allotted time. Um, next, speak as openly as you feel comfortable. This is a safe space. All responses are anonymous. At each table, there is a note taker that's going to be taking down the responses and we're going to collect those into one document, but no answer will be attributed to an individual person. So we're going to have responses as a group. So along that same guideline, we do have sign-in sheets on the table. So we do want to know who has attended, so if you can sign that, we would appreciate that. But your responses to the questions will be anonymous. Also, we ask that you help protect others' privacy by not discussing details outside of your group. And most importantly, we appreciate that you're here and that you're taking this time. Um, let's see. Um, before Mike comes up and talks about the mission statement, let's just start now with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each one of us. We so appreciate this congregation and the willingness to come together and um, share our thoughts and feelings. And we ask that you guide our discussions and let us do so, feel, feel open to share truthfully and with respect. We ask now that you bless us, bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. And now life will come and share about the mission Good morning. Good morning. Um, as we wanted to talk a bit about the mission statement and how it came to be because it's so central to this discussion. Um, so as a reminder, uh, in 2017, uh, the Strategic Planning Committee, which was comprised of Mark Garrett, Mike Goff, Bob Durbin, Barbara Kessler, Jan McMean, Thomas Scott, and David McDaniel, developed the Homeswood Baptist Church Strategic Plan, and that plan was unanimously approved by the church in August at the August 2017 business meeting. Including that plan was a recommendation to update our mission statement. Uh, the committee agreed that the mission statement uh, served as a guidepost to remind us of all of who we are as a church and what we do. So a new statement was drafted based upon the work of the transition team at the time, the senior pastor search committee, organic dialogue. We received feedback from the church through this process. We used that feedback to craft the proposed mission statement of journey through life with the inclusive Christ and embrace all with God's transforming love. That proposed statement was then sent out to administrative committees around the church, the deacon council, put a BFG folder, and the other church communications soliciting further input and feedback. And ultimately, the mission statement was presented at the November 2017 church business meeting and approved for the 
information that has obviously been in place ever since. So we just wanted to have that quick review of how the statement came to be better at that because, again, it's so simple and foundational. do is over these next few moments is go over the six biblical passages that are typically used when having conversations around human sexuality. Uh, you have already hopefully read the document, the reflections that, that were sent out. The, the analogy that I used and opened there was that that, is, that document is like a Reader's Digest version. It's not the space to go into all the details, the intricate details of the articles and the books that have been written on this. So what will best be heard is if this presentation is heard in conversation with those reflections. Uh, so today, if that was the Reader's Digest version, today what we're going to do is we're going to whet the appetite. We're going to become friendly with the texts. We're not going to be able to get into down in, into all the weeds of the text, but it is to talk generally, to start a conversation uh, with, with these passages. If you are unable to see, the printout of the slides are on the table over there. So as you leave this evening, this afternoon, you can go and take one. Uh, right now, let's not pass them out uh, just as you're leaving because I don't want you to get ahead of where I am. Jerry, if y'all just want to pick a table, pick a table, any table. If you can separate yourselves separate. as yes. well. Yeah. Meeting husband and wife not at the same table. <laughs> just for this moment. So, as we, you've heard this said in other kinds of ways, but as we read the text and as we read scriptures in general, one of the questions that you will regularly hear me say and us say is that it is very important to get inside of the text. Another way of saying it is that context matters. So what we'll do is we'll go over these passages and one of the questions that we will regularly ask is, if what is printed on the page is that the end of the conversation, or is there more going on there? What I'm going to suggest is we have to pay attention to culture. We have to pay attention to linguistics, word things, translation things. One of my friends and colleagues will regularly ask the question, is what they're talking about then what we're talking about today? So what's being said then, what is being said today? There are six basic um, passages within scripture that are discussed when talking about human sexuality. They are Genesis 19, Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11, and Romans 1. I combine the Leviticus passages and the Pauline letters into one grouping because the logic is the same as we discuss them. Genesis 19 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? The story of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There are two messengers, two angels of sorts, that appear at Lot's house one evening. Lot is the nephew of Father Abraham. Lot is asleep at night, and all of a sudden, he hears a knock on the door, opens the door, and there are these two foreigners that are asking him, can we stay in your house tonight? Because in this time period, there's no holiday inn, there's no motel down in the city square. If you were outside of the community and traveling, you were dependent upon someone in the new space to offer their home as a space of hospitality for you. But what happens, though, is that the word gets around that evening that there are these foreigners staying at Lot's house. And all, as the Hebrew text says, all the men of the city surround Lot's house and say, we demand, send out these foreigners so that we can know them. Well, that's a euphemism that we can have sex with them. Really what they're saying is they're going to rape them is what's going to happen. And the message behind that is the city of Sodom and Gomorrah weren't full of men who were gay. Rather, it was a message to these foreigners saying, you are not welcome here. You're not welcome here. We think of you so lowly that we think of you like a woman. We're going to have sex with you because that's how we relate to you right now. It's not about sexual attraction or sexual uh, uh, connectedness. 
It's a message of saying, you're not welcome here. The unfortunate thing is that that story has been misinterpreted over a number of centuries that we now have words like sodomy and sodomite. That's where this it comes from, this story. The unfortunate thing is that's not even how the Bible interprets the story. You will hear the prophets say over and over, remember the sin of Sodom, remember Sodom and Gomorrah. And what they are talking about is not same-sex activity. Look at what Ezekiel says. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, had excess of food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. Over and over, the biblical text will say the sin of Sodom is that of inhospitality, not of same-sex activity. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is inhospitality to the stranger, not same-sex activity. So if you're, reading, if you're going to read articles and books, you will even hear traditionalists say the story of Sodom and Gomorrah really doesn't fit into this conversation. It's not about same-sex activity. Traditionalists even, uh, scholars, admit this. So I bring this up because it's generally part of the everyday vernacular conversation, but it really has no space in our conversation today. We then go to two texts in Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13. The Levit Levitical law says this, A man shall not lie with another man as with a woman. It is an abomination. The Hebrew word for abomination is the Hebrew word tulva. That's what you see in parentheses. In Leviticus 20.13, If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a tova, there it is again, an abomination, a detestable act, they shall surely be put to death. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's clearly said right there. Except rarely, it's what's printed on the page, the end of the conversation. Again, our task is to get underneath and inside of the text. So let's look at the Hebrew word tova. The Hebrew word tova appears 117 times in the Old Testament. Two of those 117 are these two laws right here. That means 150, 115 other times the Levitical law talks about so-and-so being an abomination and or worthy of death. What are some of those instances? Eating rabbit is considered tola, an abomination. Eating pork but well, we live in Kansas City, the barbecue capital of the world. That's considered tova, an abomination. According to Levitical law, it says, eating shellfish and animals that are already dead. Violence is considered tova, an abomination. Oppressing the poor is tova, an abomination. Charging interest is tova, an abomination. How many of us could buy a house today without taking out a loan? Really, what's going on in this part of biblical law, it's not about the interest in and of itself. Rather, the practice at this time was if you took out a loan, the practice was that you would never be able to repay it back. You were always indebted to the lender. It's not about interest in and of itself, but to get inside and beneath it is to have someone rule over you. So, 115 times things are considered tova. One of the questions that we must ask then is, as we're reading through the biblical text, what lenses are we using to provide a consistent interpretation? That's an important question. What lenses are we using to provide a consistent interpretation? So if we're to look at the context of Leviticus, if you're going to summarize Leviticus into one statement, the, the sentence is, the thesis of Leviticus is, be holy as I am holy. And so what you'll note in that um, chapter 18, the verse right before this one is talking about child sacrifice to the Canaanite god Moloch. This was a part of their tradition. And in addition, in these, in these um, cultic temples, was that also a prostitution? It wasn't about same-sex activity. It wasn't about 
connectedness in and of itself, but it wants to worship and honor a Canaanite god. And I think what's happening here is they're saying, don't worship in that kind of way. Don't worship like the Canaanite gods. Be a separate kind of people. Be holy as I am holy. That concludes our conversations about the whole Old Testament regarding this, this subject. Sodom and Gomorrah don't apply. Two verses in Leviticus that are, I would suggest, not really talking about committed mutual relationships. Is that that, this, is what they're talking about then, what we're talking about today. We then turn our attention to the first century, to the New Testament. There are three instances in that culture in which same-sex activities were part of the normal day practice, were not unheard of. That is temple prostitution, slavery, and pederasty. Similar to the, the Canaanite temples, the first century Greco-Roman worlds where there, there were these temples to the other gods, and there were men and women prostitutes that were employees of sorts of these temples, and attendees, men and women, would sleep with both men and women temple prostitutes. And it wasn't out of a committed relationship with one another, but the idea was that as you're having sex with these temple prostitutes, you will find yourself in this heightened spiritual experience, thus connecting you closer with the God of that temple. Can you read in between the lines of how, how, that, how they can come to this conclusion? The second one is that of slavery. If a country was overthrown and went to battle and was overthrown by another country, it was a normal practice for the winning country to enslave the, the losing country. And of course, if you were a slave, you had no rights, basically. Uh, that, and so it was not unheard of for a master to have sex with the slaves that, in which uh, the family owned. The third is that of pederasty. This is the practice in which uh, a young boy who is just entering into puberty would enter into a um, scholastic kind of relationship with a, an older male mentor. The mentor would teach the young boy the, the schoolings of the day, the, the philosophies of the day. Now, the practice would be that the young boy would stay with the man and learn the teachings. And then after a few years, after the teachings were done, the final rite of it was the older man would have sex with the younger boy as a way to enter, enter manhood, is what they would say. Disproportionate relationships in each of these. I would suggest not talking about committed mutual relationships. And yet each of these were very accepted and commonplace in the first century. So it's into this space that Paul writes his letters in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1. What we find if you were to open your Bible today, uh, if you were to look at these texts, you would more than likely find the word homosexual inside of a vice list, something that you should avoid and not do in, in, in these letters. The, the Greek for it that is now translated as homosexual is the Greek word arsnikotoiai. Now what's curious about arsnikotoiai is that that word does not exist prior to the writings of Paul. It does not really show up post-writings of Paul. It's as if Paul creates the word. So what is the word? It's a compound word. It's a compound word of man and better. B-E-D-D-E-R. What does that mean? <laughs> what is man better? Well, that's why we're not really sure exactly what Paul meant. So that's why if you were to look at various translations over time, you'll find that word translated in very different kinds of ways. You would find it sometimes translated as buggers, abusers of themselves with mankind, the brutal, liars with mankind. It's not translated as homosexual until the 19th century. Basically, 1,800 years have gone by before it's translated as homosexual. And then you'll notice that it gets even more specified uh, in the 1973 version of the NIV, homosexual offenders. It's important to know that, again, for the first 1,800 years, what we're talking about today is not how translators translated it. They didn't know what it meant. So if you don't know what it culturally meant, it might be helpful to look at the surrounding context. Again, it shows up in a vice list. 
It's not very helpful unless we start to pay attention to what is surrounding it. In the vice lists, what you'll see is that this is the flow of the, the, the vices that Paul is writing about. From idol worshippers, adulterers, male prostitutes, arsenicotoii, that's where it shows up. And then the first Timothy passage after arsenicotoii, what we see is that the uh, sex slave trade is mentioned right after arsenicotoii. In each of these instances, there's a disproportional relating to one another. There is one with authority and power over one that does not have power. So if we're looking at a theme going through each of these, there's not a sense of mutually committed relationships. So if we're going to look at the context, we got to pay attention to that. We then go to Romans 1. In Romans 1, what Paul is saying is that people have forsaken the worship of God. In, even though in Romans 1, even though the Gentiles, they did not have the law, they still could experience God through creation. And yet they've chosen to worship themselves. So God let them do what was ever, whatever they wanted to according to their shameful heart. And one of the ways is they were living in excess. And so as they have sinned vertically by creating God in their own image, they've also sinned horizontally by saying, since I am God, I can do whatever I want with my appetites regardless of how it affects anyone who is around me. We then turn to our first Romans, Romans 1 passage. Paul writes this in 26. For this reason, God gave them over to their degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own persons due penalty of their error. Again, if you're to read it, it's pretty quite clear. And that's actually what traditionalists would say. The seed to affirm same-sex people is to violate God's creative intent and to create something that is unnatural. What I'll suggest, though, is that seems to ignore how Paul uses the phrase natural and unnatural in other places in the New Testament. This, uh, one of the things is this goes back to the social order of that of patriarchy. Men were at the top of the society. Women were at the bottom of society. And so one of the ways is that when a man was in a dominant position, including that of sex, it was considered natural. If a woman, and if a man, though, were in a passive stance within sex, it was considered unnatural. The opposite is that true for women. Same-sex relations then challenge this understanding of having nature of nature by having a man at times in a passive role and sometimes a woman in a dominant role, thus making it all unnatural. To be clear, though, these understandings are discussing roles in society, and they're not talking about what is what we say straight or gay today. In addition, when Paul talks about natural and unnatural in other spaces, such as that of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that it was unnatural for a man to have long hair. So Paul says, if Aaron had her druthers, I would have much longer hair. She likes running her fingers. If you were to see a picture of me from college, I had much longer hair. And yet Paul is saying that that is unnatural. This, I think, is why it's important for us to become aware that we are using a, con a consistent interpretive lens when reading through the scriptures. Again, what we're questioning here through the, the, these New, Tes New Testament passages is what is really going on here. I would suggest it appears that there is a prohibition against unequally powered individuals <coughs> rather than a prohibition against mutually committed partners. Let that sink in for a moment. So as we look through these texts, one of the questions that we have to ask is, is what they're talking about then, what we are talking about today? As my friend says, is that, the that, this. And what are the consistent interpretive lenses that we are using as we read through these scripture passages? 
that's about as fast as one can go through these six texts. Um, so what you will find uh, is that there are some books on the table if you want to do further reading yourself. Those are just sample books. Each one of those books, uh, there are multiple copies in the church library. You might consider reading through them yourself. Um, again, the PowerPoint slides are over on the table, as well as there's a packet of, of definitions of sorts. Sometimes it can be confusing to, you know, LGBTQ. What, what is all of that? It's, there are all these definitions. Well, there's a packet that sort of helps walk through and talk through that. We're about to transition into our small group time. There they are. Um, what we will do here is there will be some questions that will be asked, and you're asked to, as a group, speak for yourself, but then also listen to each other. And as the deacons worked last year about how to create a process for these conversations, we name and recognize that Holmeswood is a diverse church. And we live in a world today that likes to live into polarities. You are one or the other. There's this great temptation to draw a line in the sand that says, you either stand on this side or this side. What we are hoping to do here at Holmeswood is not live into one or the other, but create a third or fourth space or option for us to engage as a congregation. And so one way that we are going to look at this is as we enter the space, we'll leave you this question. As you are speaking for yourself and listening to each other, what if everybody is right? You have truth inside of you that I need to hear. And I have truth inside of me that you need to hear. And this is not about drawing lines in the sand. What if everybody is right? Let's go to our small groups.